Since 2009, scientists and volunteers of Quiot have been monitoring juvenile Chinook salmon migrating through the San Juan Islands to the ocean from rivers in Puget Sound and from the Fraser River. This is our 13th annual report on the health the growth, the survival, and the diet of juvenile Chinook salmon from the Salish Sea. I'm Russell Barsh, and this is our 2021 report of findings from our salmon research. In brief, a few things stand out. We thought that we might see some recovery of Chinook salmon after the very, very warm years of the mid-teens that saw a dramatic decline. However, despite a few blips, we are continuing to see significantly reduced numbers of juvenile Chinook salmon leaving the rivers of the Salish Sea and migrating to the ocean. We're also continuing to see a decrease in the diet quality of juvenile salmon. They appear to be eating less fish, and as a whole, their total dietary intake has remained low and has decreased particularly with Puget Sound fish over the last decade. We've also begun to notice some effects of climate change on the timing of juvenile Chinook migrations to the ocean. They are leaving a little earlier and earlier still actually from the Fraser River. The Fraser system appears to be responding more um, at, a, at a, greater, a greater level than Puget Sound fish. So uh, changes in run timing, particularly with Fraser origin salmon, uh, have become conspicuous. We've been spending more of our effort looking at what salmon eat in recent years and what their forage fish, uh, forage fish prey eat and how that's affected by climate change. And uh, what we found in particular is that the arrival of anchovies in the islands as a new forage fish, uh, or at least a renewed forage fish, having been gone from the biological record here for about 4,000 years. The return of anchovy has been very interesting. Uh, they did arrive in the islands uh, just about the end of the summer of 2021. Uh, they were being eaten by juvenile Chinook. Uh, we have also seen them utilized by adult resident Chinook or blackmouth salmon. And we've noticed that they forage quite differently than herring and sand lance. We'll return to that in just a few minutes, but anchovies appear to uh, occupy a different ecological level in the food web here now that they have returned and are thriving in the Salish Sea. And uh, that suggests that they may actually add to the diet quality of salmon at some point and be more resilient than herring and sand lance have proven to be as our seas get warmer. So let's dive in first uh, to just clarify where we are and what we do. If you're not familiar with our work, uh, you need to know that we have two seining stations where we collect juvenile salmon and forage fish so that we can determine what they're eating and what kinds of conditions and abundance uh, they have from year to year. We have one station at the north end of the San Juan Islands at Cowlitz Bay on Waldron Island which is mostly visited by juvenile Chinook salmon coming out of the Fraser River. So it's essentially a viewpoint for examining how climate change and human activity is affecting uh, Fraser origin Chinook salmon and other migratory fish in the Fraser system. Our other seining site is on the southeast corner of Lopez Island at Watmo Bay. And this looks into Admiralty Inlet and is mostly visited by juvenile Chinook exiting Puget Sound proper. So uh, that really is the point at which we have our greatest contact with wild production and hatchery 
salmon coming out of Puget Sound proper at Western Washington, including the federally listed endangered uh, Chinook Puget Sound stocks. We've examined nearly 5,000 <laughs> juvenile salmon over the years. And uh, at this point, we feel we have a pretty good sense of what's happening over time, but this is an ongoing project. So we will continue to report from year to year on changes as we see them and as the climate and the level of human activity in the Sailor Sea continues to change. So first of all, let's look just at how many juvenile Chinook have uh, come through the system on their way to the ocean since we began monitoring in 2009. Uh, in this chart, you can see green bars, which uh, represent the fish that we caught at Cowlitz, and the blue bars, the fish we caught at Watmau. So green bars, Fraser fish, blue bars, mostly Puget Sound fish. And this represents catch per unit effort. So this is on average for each year, how many of these little juvenile salmon we caught per set of our seine at each site. Uh, you can see that there was quite a bulge. We had lots and lots of fish uh, in uh, 2011 to 2013, then it dropped precipitously and it is not, it is not recovered. Uh, we expected to see a, another cyclical movement in the abundance of juvenile Chinook uh, about uh, five years ago. And there was a little bit of a blip you can see in 2018, a little bit of an increase from uh, Puget Sound. And in 2020, a little bit of an increase from the Fraser River. But uh, on the whole, numbers have been low. And in 2021, they were as low as we have ever seen. In addition to being uh, somewhat scarcer than they have been in the past, uh, juvenile Chinook, unmarked Chinook, wild production, uh, have decreased somewhat in size. And that, for a fishery biologist, is a serious concern. It suggests that they are uh, growing more slowly and leaving their freshwater uh, natal habitats at a smaller size when they are more vulnerable to predators because of that small size. You can see here that at least for the blue bars, which again is Watmau, Puget Sound fish, that there's been a decrease of about 10% since we began monitoring in 2009 in the average size of the juvenile Chinook that we pick up at our study sites. So 10% uh, decrease is not a huge amount, but the fact that this has happened uh, in a fairly uh, consistent gradual decline over, uh, over 13 seasons is a matter for some concern, again, that there's a problem, probably a combination of a bottom-up problem, which is diet, what there is for them to eat, and uh, conditions in streams that may, uh, for example, from heating, from uh, climate change, that may get them to leave earlier at, an, uh, at a really small size that makes them more vulnerable to uh, perishing on their way to the ocean. One of the things that's most important uh, in what we're finding is that the ratio of wild production fish, fish that are reproducing on their own in streams in traditional spawning areas, to hatchery fish that are produced in British Columbia and Washington State hatcheries, has changed quite dramatically over the years. It's up and down, but if you look again, look at the blue bars, Watmau, Puget Sound origin fish for the most part, uh, there's been quite a significant increase in the proportion of our juvenile salmon, juvenile Chinook out migrants that come from hatcheries rather than wild production. And it averages out over the last uh, six years or so to uh, about 50%. So at this point, uh, not so much from Fraser, so the Fraser, but definitely from Puget Sound, our juvenile Chinook migrating through the islands, about half of them are coming out of hatcheries rather than wild production. And that is a cause for some concern because there's a limit to what we can do with hatcheries and the diversity and the uh, economy, the efficiency of wild production and natural stream spawning uh, is not something to, to, to lose uh, without uh, considerable concern. So that's one of the other things that has been happening that suggests that 
we are still in the woods when it comes to juvenile Chinook and overall Chinook salmon recovery. Run timing is an interesting, um, an interesting issue. We would expect as we get warmer weather, um, milder winters, but also much hotter and drier summers here in the Salish Sea region, that this may affect the timing when uh, juvenile salmon decide to leave the rivers, the river deltas, and work their way through salt water on their way to the sea. The effect is not particularly strong for the Puget Sound fish, which are coming out of fairly small rivers, mostly in the South Sound, and then working their way through Puget Sound, through salt water up to the islands here. Uh, there has been a shift back and forth, but on the whole to um, coming out uh, maybe two weeks earlier than we saw 13 years or so ago. But if we look now at the, um, at the uh, Fraser River fish, at the juvenile Chinook coming out of the Fraser and intercepted at our Cowlitz site, uh, we've had a few years now, 2015, 2016, and then last year, 2021, when they pretty well all came through by mid-June, where, where essentially there was a very rapid exodus instead of dribbling out of the streams over a period of two or three months with some still working their way through the San Juan Islands and the Strait of Juan de Fuca in August, uh, in these three recent years, including 2021, we saw the Fraser Chinook just run through the system uh, very quickly in about six weeks and have nothing coming out of the Fraser in the late summer. Uh, and this may indicate what's going to happen in the future everywhere, that warmer fresh water and warmer salt water are combining to push juvenile salmon prematurely perhaps out of the freshwater environment, out of the deltas, and through the midwater, the so-called neuritic saltwater of the shallow Sailor Sea into the open ocean. Another factor that would tend to mean smaller fish, more vulnerable to predation, arriving in the ocean at the end of the summer. So let's look at diet. Diet is, is what fascinates me the most because uh, what, eat, what eats what is really at the heart of what ecology is all about. It's the way in which energy and nutrients flow through a system from bottom to top and back through recyclers, through recycling organisms to the bottom again. Uh, over the years, we've gotten a very clear picture of what the average diet of juvenile Chinook salmon as they pass through the islands has been. And uh, this chart shows the average over the entire period of study from 2009 to uh, this last year to 2021. Very, very clearly most of the diet over these years, just shy of 80% of the diet, is sandlance, Pacific sandlance, and Pacific herring. Sandlance and herring pretty close historically in proportion to each other, although I'm going to show you some recent changes that have knocked out that particular part of the picture, but sand lance and herring making up most of the diet, all other species of fish, and we have found a dozen other species of fish in, in salmon stomachs, but all the other species of fish uh, really only make up uh, about uh, three or four percent of the uh, prey biomass that our little Chinook salmon are eating in the islands. Uh, and this includes smelt and, um, and pricklebacks, sticklebacks, flatfish, uh, juvenile greenlings, all sorts of things that they sometimes eat. But interestingly, juvenile Chinook are very particular and they select herring and Pacific sand lance over everything else that's the same size and thus potentially available to eat. If they don't find them, they'll eat crustaceans, and from year to year this varies, but the usual crustaceans that are on the diet are larval crab and uh, young krill, um, euphousids. Larval crab and krill make up most of it. 
Uh, and very frequently, particularly in late summer after most of the crustaceans have already developed uh, into juveniles that are either on the bottom or are too big for salmon to get into their mouths, some consumption of terrestrials. Well, that's insects mostly, some spiders, some arachnids too, but mostly midges and other insects that swarm over salt water and often fall in and produce patches of floating dead insects that are really easy for little salmon to pick off. In fact, that is basically what they're doing in the rivers. So they're going back to their freshwater habit and eating some terrestrials. But terrestrials and crustaceans, invertebrates, still make up less than 20% uh, of the diet of the juvenile Chinook that we're seeing going through the islands. So forage fish is what it's about. And we saw a really interesting change. In 2021, uh, we got lots of little young herring from a large spawning event around uh, Admiralty Inlet in Quilcene. Also, there was a significant amount of spawning on the south shores of uh, the Strait of Juan de Fuca. So a whole bunch of little young of the year herring about the size of uh, a quarter were in the islands uh, in, uh, in the summer of 2021. And so our juvenile Chinook feasted on herring and that brought their total fish consumption up somewhat this year. Um, also meant that they ate more herring than they ate sand lance, much more herring than they ate sand lance this year compared to previous years. And the chart uh, here, you can see the red bars are 2021. And the main thing that you can see between the red bars this last summer and the previous uh, years, the average for the previous years, is that big spike in herring consumption, which may not be repeated because we are only seeing big herring spawns like this perhaps once every five years or more in the Salish Sea nowadays. So this was an unusual and probably not soon repeated event. Other aspects of diet did not change much, but this gets us to a very important uh, question about what the long-term effects are of climate change and development on the quality of the juvenile Chinook diet. And here we have a chart showing consumption of fish with two bars, one herring, one sand lance. Uh, so you can compare the movement, as it were, of consumption of each of these critical forage fish. And you can see that both bars are going down, and the last five years, we have seen significantly less consumption of both forage fishes by juvenile Chinook, so that we could say that overall, uh, juvenile Chinook are not getting as much fish in their diet as they did five to 13 years ago. This is an important change. Uh, a bottom-up process, the kind of thing that we're most concerned about in terms of the factors that determine the survival rate and the growth rate of juvenile Chinook as they rear in the Salish Sea on their way out to the ocean. The major concern at this point is do they have enough to eat because they're eating relatively high in the food web. All sorts of other factors could reduce the quality of their diet, reduce the availability of what they like to eat. And this seems to have cut in sharply since 2017. A significant reduction in consumption of fish will mean slower growth, perhaps uh, lower survival. So what's driving that? Um, if we look at a chart of just the availability of forage fish, how many sand lance and herring are swimming around the San Juan Islands. So this is a chart that shows you from year to year what our average bycatch of herring and sand lance has been since we began this project. You can see that there are periodic, every few years, a huge spike, typically in sand lance. But if you look closely at the blue bars, there's also some variation every few years in the uh, the average uh, catch per set, the catch per unit effort of herring. It's big differences from year to year in how many forage fish are 
in the waters of the San Juan Islands. And it's not, uh, it, it's not a small effect. <laughs> it's varying between a few hundred uh, average uh, forage fish in a, in a sane set to tens of thousands of forage fish in an average sane set. So wildly, wildly uh, unpredictable patterns in forage fish abundance. And on the whole, you can see also, again, uh, some reduction, some, some evidence of a reduction since the mid-teens, the mid-20-teens. So what's going on here? Well, if we're concerned about what salmon eat, we might also consider that what our forage fishes are eating may be a problem, that this may be a bottom-up problem that goes to the very bottom of the food web and affects the plankton that forage fishes like herring are eating and thus affects the availability of forage fishes for salmon to eat. But we've been looking more closely over the last five years at the forage fish diet this is a little bit different problem than looking at salmon diet. When we're looking at a Chinook, uh, it's a fairly big fish. We can uh, put a little tube down its throat, pump its stomach, it's what we refer to uh, professionally as non-lethal lavage. So it's just washing out the stomach with a little salt water. Um, almost all the fish survive. They just lose their lunch. And we bring the lunch back to the laboratory to see what it was. With the forage fishes, which are much smaller, the only way to determine what they've been eating is to bring them back to the lab and open them up. And this is a dissection in this picture of a single sand lance, which is about the size of an old-fashioned cigarette or a stubby pen. Uh, and you can see the orange stomach there. And actually also this was a, a mature male. The white in there is milt. It's the milt sacs. That little tiny orange stomach, which is the size of a small bean <laughs> is, is the whole uh, meal, I mean, 24 hours of food for that sand lance. And when we open it up, we find things like, in the inset uh, picture here, uh, there's a, a small krill, uh, which looks somewhat shrimp-like, but with huge eyes and a whole bunch of little calanoid copepods, crustaceans, small crustaceans. Um, a sand lance might eat a thousand of them or several thousand of them stuffed in that stomach during a day's foraging. And so it's a somewhat more tedious uh, problem to look at what forage fishes are eating because it involves dissection and counting huge numbers of bits and pieces of, of, uh, of prey. But it's yielded very, very interesting results. This is probably, I think, the most important work we've been doing recently. Um, before taking a look at the results, though, what I want to emphasize is that this is very much associated with, this brings us to thinking about climate change because the zooplankton, the invertebrates like larval crabs and larval krill and small copepods living in the surface waters of the Salish Sea are very much directly affected by two extremely important forces. One is warmer water, because they are in the warmest part of the, of the water column, exposed to the sun, and pollution, because all the oily stuff that we put in the water, from oil spills down to household products that get flushed uh, out by rainwater into our storm sewers and our shorelines, ends up in this upper layer of the water column, in the newston, as we call it. And that's where the food of forage fishes is found. It's small animals living, for the most part, in the newston, very sensitive to both climate change and to human waste. So what have we been seeing? Well, one thing we've been seeing that uh, is very exciting is that we're seeing uh, more anchovies show up. And this has made our forage fish study more uh, complicated, but more interesting, because we now have three fish that potentially are important to salmon. We know herring and sand lance are. We're beginning to see salmon eat anchovies too. The numbers of anchovies have gone up significantly in the last few years. 
And so we've included them in the study, hoping that we would see some good news here that anchovies might contribute positively to the diet of juvenile Chinook salmon without competing for food with the other forage fishes that juvenile salmon already eat. Anyway, that has been the framework for the last few years of our work is, is there competition among forage fishes? And are they all similarly sensitive to climate change and to, human, to pollution, to human activity? Or are some more resilient than others? And is that where the future lies? Well, let's take a look. One thing that we learned <laughs> is that Pacific sand lance, which have nice little sharp beaks, as you could see, uh, and big eyes, turn out to be extremely selective. And rather than simply opening up those mouths and plowing through the water, through the nuston like a shark and swallowing whatever is in front of them, they are selectively pecking particular things out of the water. And what they tend to peck, and if you look at this, this uh, graph, you can see it quite uh, clearly. What they tend to peck are big calanoid copepods. So uh, if you look at the prey available, the left-hand column, prey available is that's what's in the plankton. That's done by using a plankton net and we just count everything that's in there. That's what's floating around that a fish could choose to eat. And if it was non-selective, if the fish just opened its mouth and ate whatever was in front of it, what's in its stomach should be the same proportions as what's in the, in the plankton or what uh, oceanographers would refer to as the prey field. What you see here is that uh, on this particular date, and um, this is looking at data from 2019, well, just shy of 500 sand lance that we examined that year, uh, what was in the prey field was mostly little tiny calanoid copepods, as small as fleas, literally as small as fleas. There were a very small number of large copepods, two, three, four, five millimeters in size, considerably larger, uh, significantly like an order of magnitude, bulkier and richer in calories. That's the red bar in the right hand uh, column here, sand lamps were selectively picking out the big copepods and leaving behind everything else. So very interesting that, that if you can see that shift from the little copepods, which dominate the prey field to the big copepods, which is the red bar on the right, uh, that is a very strong indication that sand lamps know what they like, work hard to find it, and selectively peck out these larger copepods. And that gets very interesting because the, we have learned from oceanographic studies that the larger copepods are only seasonally available. They only come to the surface of the water from winter until midsummer. And their abundance varies in response to water temperatures. So that this is a direct link between sand lance foraging strategy and a prey type that is very sensitive to annual changes in water temperatures and has a season each year which could change and shift in ways that could benefit or hurt sand lance survival. Okay, that's the sand lance. Now let's move and look at the herring. The prey field in this case, this is one of many charts that we've, we've worked out for particular days. Obviously, from a scientific viewpoint, this only makes sense if you catch two or more different forage fishes in the same net at the same time in the same place so that they had the opportunity to eat the same things. It's almost like a naturalistic experiment. I mean, you could imagine putting them in a tank together with something to eat but this is uh, something that we can simply do and do with much greater, uh, greater validity by waiting for those days when our net pulls in, say, herring and sand lance from the same bay at the same time, and we can put a net, a plankton net in the water, see what the prey field was and how each of these forage fishes responded to what was available. And look here, the left-hand bar, which is mostly blue, 
and in this case the blue is the little tiny <laughs> little tiny calanoid copepods uh the sand lance middle bar ate the big ones that's the red so <laughs> in this case you can see again that the sand lance chose from that prey field the larger calanoid copepods but look at the herring the right hand bar they went mostly for hyperid amphipods, another kind of small crustacean, a pelagic one, and the yellow, they ate larval fish. So the herring were actually eating different things in the prey field than the sand lance. But in both cases, these forage fishes were very selectively picking out what they wanted. Neither of them was simply eating what was available. Both of them were foraging selectively and differently. Very interesting. Well, that's why we can have both of them in our waters potentially thrive and be abundant without, uh, as it were, interfering with each other because they don't necessarily go after the same, the same prey. They don't necessarily compete for a limited amount of prey of a certain type. Now let's look at the anchovies and things get very interesting. So um, I've got the anchovies in the middle here between the herring and the prey field. And if you look at that, ah, very interesting. The herring in this particular case, this was just a few months ago. The herring went for copepods, blue bar. They selected copepods, though there was something else much more abundant in the water. That green bar are big diatoms, coscinodiscus. These are diatoms that look like green hockey pucks. And they're about a quarter of the size of the copepods, but enormously abundant. It's an, an irony that, that the sea here in the islands greens up in the fall as the rain begins and the rains wash nutrients from summer growth and, and uh, the, the, the life cycle of plants in the summer washes all that uh, plant material into the uh, waters around the islands. In the fall, there's a marine green up, a flourishing of marine algae, particularly the diatoms, taking advantage of those nutrients. So in the fall, actually, the water is full of large diatoms, these big green hockey pucks. Look at the prey field on the right, uh, about three quarters of what was in the water was big green hockey pucks, was diatoms. And what the anchovies do, that's most of what they ate <laughs> and almost none of what the herring ate. And this is herring and anchovies that were caught in the same net, at the same time in the same bay. What this is telling us is actually that anchovies are more like the classic idea of a forage fish as a fish that just opens its mouth and plows forward like a shark and swallows what's ever in front of it. Because the anchovies that we caught in the fall of, of 2021 pretty much just ate what was there in the same proportions it was in our plankton toes. But the herring and the sand lance were selective. They ate crustaceans mostly. The anchovies were eating plants mostly. <laughs> and so the anchovies were actually eating lower in the food web than herring or sand lance did. Now, what does that mean? Well, for one thing, that means that this in ecological terms is much like the difference between ungulates like deer that are eating greenery and uh, big cats and wolves that only eat carnivores, uh, the carnivores that only eat, <laughs> excuse me, carnivores that only eat other animals that eat plants. And so anchovies eating plant material you know, further down in the food web uh, would suggest that they are more efficient and potentially might be less sensitive to changes in the food web structure as a whole. Generally speaking, as we talk about when we discuss food security on the global stage, we're concerned about people eating further down on the food web because it's more efficient and less, uh, less likely to be disrupted by changes in our environment. 
And we're seeing a fish version of this here in the waters around San Juan County used by juvenile salmon that anchovies are moving in and they're eating further down in the food web. Maybe that means that they are going to be more resilient to climate change, that they will be able to thrive in a way that does not push aside the more selective carnivorous foragers like herring and sand lance. Uh, it would be nice to think that that would be the case because in that case, anchovies would be additive. They would restore some of the breadth of fish availability for a juvenile Chinook that seems to have been lost during the years that we've been doing this study. Um, but will salmon eat the anchovies? Well, we did have juvenile salmon eating juvenile anchovies in the fall of 2021 when their timing just overlapped by a few weeks. And when we studied in the last few winters, the diet of blackmouth salmon, resident Chinook salmon in the San Juan Islands, we found that many of them were eating adult anchovies. And that really is a very good sign because it suggests that both as juveniles and as adults, Chinook will eat anchovies if they're there. And they're becoming more and more there <laughs> as they expand their range within the, and their abundance in the Salish Sea. So from a, uh, the point of view of the ecology of Chinook salmon, what we learned in 2021 is that some of the downward trends, um, fewer juvenile outmigrants, fewer wild production outmigrants, smaller outmigrants, outmigrants eating less fish on average than they had in the past, those downward trends are all still in place and they're still heading down. But the hopeful sign is that we have some evidence that a new third forage fish choice for juvenile and adult salmon is expanding its range, increasing its presence in the Salish Sea, uh, is definitely palatable to salmon. Not clear whether they would go out of their way to find them, but they certainly will eat them. And they appear by virtue of what we're learning from their diet to potentially be more resilient to climate change than the forage fishes that Chinook salmon have eaten thus far. So we have uh, some bad news and some good news. The bad news is that we have not alleviated the forces that are depressing our uh, wild Chinook stocks, but we have potentially a countervailing change in the prey field that's emerging ironically also as a result of climate change because it's warming water that's bringing anchovies up from the California coast up the California current into the Salish Sea and establishing and spawning here in the Salish Sea. So that's the adaptive possibility that our work is suggesting. And when we make our 2022 report in a year, we might have some of a better idea of whether that is in fact the direction that things are changing. Thank you for your support of this program, which relies as much on volunteers and local donations as anything else. We have remained a volunteer program primarily since we started in the Audis, and we rely totally on Islanders for making it possible to catch so many fish and to process so many fish on the beaches. So stay tuned, and perhaps in next year's report, which will be our 14th, I think, uh, we will have a better idea of whether this countervailing movement of anchovies into our waters is going to have a significant positive effect on the survival of our Chinook salmon.